What's up, everybody? Welcome back in to the Philly Sports Power Hour. After a day off, I missed my Power Hour crew yesterday. Hope everybody had a great day. We should be getting ready for Philly's opening day today, but the weather did not permit for the second straight year. They got to move opening day. But hey, it's a long season. What's one more day, I guess? What's one more day? But we're streaming live across the Jacob Sports Network. We're also streaming live on the Bill Calarulo Philly Sports Talk Network. We're live on TikTok as well. But I want to spend a lot of time today talking about the fight in Phil's. Because I know we spend a lot of time talking about our Eagles, as we should. You know, they're close to my heart. But today we're going to talk about the fightings. Because they got a real shot. They have a real shot of doing something special this year. When you look at that lineup, you look at that pitching staff, even their bullpen was just ranked as the number one bullpen in Major League Baseball. So we'll talk about that. And we're going to be joined later on in the show, like we are every Thursday, by my man, Mark Farzetta. And we all know Farzi is a big Phillies guy. So a bunch of Phillies talk today. Hope you enjoy it. But let's get a little roll call in the chat. We will talk some Sixers and some Flyers as well. I was at the Sixers game last night. That was a tough loss. Flyers back in action tonight. And then like we end every show, a little today in sports history. But let's get a little roll call. Adam's Exploits in the house. Wine Niners wine, my man. Adam's Exploits. Oh, yes, it is wine that does his little spiel. <laughs> MC, Jason A-Team. Crawley with a big bills. Eric Gallagher, Cody, Flexing and Steppen. Good to see everybody. Get you checked in on TikTok as well. But let's jump right into the Sixers because I see you talking about it. Adam's exploits. Tough Sixers loss. I thought it was over when Maxi turned over the ball. Crowley says the Sixers got robbed. Flexing and Steppen, the Sixers got cheated. Crowley says it was a clear foul. I'm not usually one to blame the rest, but that was crazy. So that was probably the most heated that I have seen Nick Nurse towards referees. So if you didn't watch the game last night, Sixers fall 108-107 to the L.A. Clippers. It was James Harden's first game back in Philadelphia. As expected, he gets booed like crazy. Not only in the introductions, but every time he touched the ball, he was getting booed. He said after the game he wasn't sure why he was being booed. Didn't think the fans even knew why he was being booed. But the play that everybody's talking about, end of the game. First off, Kawhi Leonard took that game over at the end of the game. I still have nightmares of Kawhi from 2019. But he took that game over. Ends up blocking a ball with about five seconds left that gets stuck up against the rim. So it's got to be a jump ball. Sixers win the jump ball. Kelly Oubre is driving to the basket. Paul George fouls him. Clear foul. Refs don't call it. Time runs out. Sixers lose 108-107. Nurse loses his mind. Kelly Oubre loses his mind. Starts calling all the refs a bitch. Says your grandmom's a bitch. Your dad's a bitch. Your mom's a bitch. So Oubre wasn't happy either. But after the game, to make it even more frustrating, the head of officiating told Keith Pompey it was, in fact, a foul that should have been called on Paul George. So very frustrating and a tough loss for the Sixers. Because they did get some good news before the game. Before the game, Nick Nurse said there was a very good likelihood that Joel Embiid would be back before the playoffs. And if the Sixers won that game, they would have got one step closer to a six seed. And they should have won that game. They pretty much won. They were leading pretty much the entire game until the fourth quarter. So they blow that game, and now they fall a game and a half behind the Indiana Pacers for the sixth seed. Sixers are sitting in an eighth seed. That would have been a big game. And I see Flexen and Stebbin saying the NBA has got to start holding these refs accountable. Crowley says Oubre is going to be fine for being right. You're probably right. I'm sure he will be fine. 
But, and I see, where did I just see it? Jason A-Team saying Kawhi is still that good. It's crazy. He really is that good. But Sixers fall. Kawhi drops 17 points, 9 rebounds. Paul George, 22 points, 10 rebounds. James Harden did have a double-double with 16 points, 14 assists. For the Sixers, Oubre with a double-double, 17 points, 11 rebounds. Mo Bamba with his first double double in a Sixers uniform, 12 points, 11 boards. Tyrese Maxey played close to 44 minutes last night, 26 points. Kyle Lowry only played 22 minutes last night. But Sixers now, nine games left, one and a half games back. Fly guys are back in action. We're going to talk Phils in a second. I see people asking about the Phillies on TikTok. We're going to talk Phillies in one second. But the Philadelphia Flyers are back in action tonight at Montreal. Now, the Canadians are not a very good team, but they have won two games in a row. But the Flyers need to win this game. They are only one point up on the Washington Capitals. Capitals have won three in a row going up against the Toronto Maple Leafs, who've lost two in a row. But the Maple Leafs are a good squad. Hopefully, Flyers win the night. Capitals lose, they can go up three points on the Caps. But the Capitals still have two games in hand. So this is an important game for the Flyers in Montreal. But let's talk some fighting Phils. And we're going to talk some Phillies with Mark Farzetta when he joins the show. But the big question, I guess, going into the season, the overall question, and we're going to get into the lineup in a second, but the overall question is, can they win the NL East? Can the Philadelphia Phillies win the L- NL East this season. And I know at first blush, you look at, ah, oh, they're never going to be able to catch the Braves. They finished 14 games back of the Braves last year. But when you really look at the numbers, once again, the Phillies had a slow start last season. They had a slow start in 2022. They started that season 21-29, and 29, fired Joe Girardi. Then they go on their tear, takes them all the way to the World Series. 2023, they come out. They lose their first four games of the year. They then start 25 and 30. After starting the season 25 and 30, in the next 107 games, they go 65 and 42. That's a winning percentage of over 607. If the Phillies can just avoid the slow start, if they just come out, and they can play 600 baseball the entire 162-game season that they showed they could play last year, that's 98 wins. They could very easily get to 98, 100 wins. The Braves won the division last year with 104 wins. But the Braves won eight of their 13 games against the Fighting Phils, eight and five. If the Phillies can avoid a slow start and win a couple of these series against the Braves, they got a real shot at winning the NL East. And we'll talk to Farsi about it, but I think they can do it. And here's why I think they can do it. Not only did they have a slow start last year, let's look back at what happened. You didn't have a healthy Bryce Harper playing first base. Because of that, you had Schwarber at times in the field. You lost Reese Hoskins in spring training, something they weren't anticipating. Ranger Suarez now had his first spring training where there were no issues, no injuries, no visa issues, no World Baseball Classic. And speaking of the World Baseball Classic, Trey Turner, hopefully he doesn't have the long slump he had to start the season coming off of the World Baseball Classic. JT Romuto should be better at the plate this season. So you look up and down that roster, and then you add a bat to your bench like Whit Merrifield. This team's got a real shot at winning the NL East. I'm not ready to concede it and say, sure, it's the Atlanta Braves. As long as they avoid the slow start, they still have very good pitching. Wheeler now added a splitter to his arsenal. How does Aaron Nola respond? For me, he's the X factor because is Aaron Nola, after getting that big money deal, is he going to come out and be relaxed and actually play really well and pitch really well? Or is he going to try to earn that contract with every single pitch? 
What did we see with Jalen Hurts and the Philadelphia Eagles last year? A lot of what we heard after the season was the big contract changed him. What does the big contract do to Aaron Nola? Does it help him pitch a little bit more relaxed? Or does it make him press a little bit? To me, he's the X factor. You know what you're going to get from Wheeler. I think with a healthy spring training, with no issues with Ranger Suarez, you're going to see a really good season from Ranger. But what do we get from Aaron Nola? But I like this lineup. I really like this lineup. I mean, I'm just looking up and down the lineup. Schwarber, Turner, Harper, Bohm, Bryson Stott. Could Bryson Stott hit 300 this year? He was batting 302. 302 until August 11th, and then he went on a little slump, finished the season 280. Could Bryson Stott hit 300 this year? If you're in the chat, what do you think Bryson Stott does this season? And I look at Stott as a guy still young. He should be better this year. So you look at Schwarber. Schwarber's going to give you what he gives you. Could he hit 50 home runs this year? He hit 47 last year. Trey Turner. Trey Turner hit 266 last season. You look at his prior five seasons, 298, 328, 335, 298, 271. He's going to have a better season at the plate. So Schwarber should give you what he gives you. Turner should be better. Bryce Harper wasn't healthy all year last year. Started to come on in June. You're going to get a full season from Harper. I'm expecting big things from Alec Bohm. 20 home runs, 97 RBIs last year. Bryson Stott, we just talked about, could hit 300. JT Ramuto only hit 252 last season. So I expect him to be better at the plate. Nick Castellanos, 272, close to 30 home runs, over 100 RBIs last season. But he goes through those long slumps. Very streaky hitter. If he could just avoid that. Stop chasing low and away, Casty. Then you have Brandon Marsh. And then your nine hole, Johan Rojas. And we've talked about this before. Should Johan Rojas have started in AAA? No freaking way. Not when you're describing this guy. Larry Boa described Johan Rojas as being a generational talent in the outfield when it comes to fielding in center field. You need that on your team. And when you go through and you look like Schwarber, Turner, Harper, Boom, Stott, Romuto, Castellanos, if this team is losing games because Johan Rojas is bat, then you got bigger problems. These games should not be coming down to Johan Rojas' bat in the nine hole when you have seven hitters like I just named. And even Brandon Marsh batted 277 last year. So I know Ricky Batalico has compared this to 2008 when the Phillies won the World Series. Their eight-hole hitter that year was Carlos Ruiz. Chooch. Carlos Ruiz didn't hit well. Wasn't great at the plate. But it was what he gave you behind the plate as a catcher. That's why you could get away with him not batting 260, 270. I think you get a similar thing from Johan Rojas. And I see Crowley saying he still has to hit. He'll get there. But we don't need Rojas to win games with his bat. And I see on TikTok, Steel City, not sold on Rojas. Napstar, I'd still take Pache over Rojas. Talking about Carlos Ruiz, he always came up in the big moments. He did. Carlos Ruiz had some big hits in those postseason runs. But let's give this guy a shot. He's that good in the field. But we're going to talk to Farzi about Rojas, too, when he joins the show. But I just look at this lineup, and there is no reason why they cannot win the NL East. I'm not ready to wave the white flag. 
and say, hey, we're just going to give it to the Atlanta Braves. Now, the question is, do we want to win the NL East? Because we've now seen it two years in a row with the new wild card format. Do you want to win the NL East? Do you want to be sitting at home while the other teams are playing in the wild card and you start to get a little bit rusty, potentially? Is that what happened with the Braves? But for me, I want to win the NL East. You listen to these players from spring training. They want to win the NL East as well. So I think they're going to be hungrier this year. We talk about the Philadelphia Eagles as having a collapse down the stretch. What happened with the Phillies last year was probably worse. Losing to the Arizona Diamondbacks, losing two games at Citizens Bank Park, the place that's supposed to be the toughest place to play in baseball in October. So I think this team is going to be motivated. I think they're going to be healthier to start the year, something they haven't been over the last couple of seasons. And I think if they just avoid the slow start, they could absolutely get to 100 wins and win the NL East. So we're going to take a quick break because when we get back, my man Mark Farzetta is going to be joining the show. And if you know Farzi, you know he loves his fight and fills. So I want to do a bunch of Phillies talk with Farzi. So we're going to take a quick break. But don't go anywhere because the one and only Mark Farzetta will be joining the show after the break. Imagine for a moment that you went to work today and when you came home, you were catastrophically injured. Your life and your family's life. That's what happened to union construction worker Mike Little. I was scared of what the end was going to be, but to be 100% honest with you, I knew I was going to be all right just by talking with Brian. In my heart, I just knew everything was going to be all right. Call the firm and find out why they say, we got this. Call 215-458-2222. Field of life. First Trust Bank is there for you. Champions on three. One, two, three. Because Philadelphia dreams deserve a Philadelphia bank. Underdog Fantasy is the easiest place to play fantasy sports and certainly the easiest when you're watching the NBA and the NBA playoffs are almost here and you can win money making picks. What are you waiting for? Sign up on underdogfantasy.com and use the promo code WIN. An underdog will double your first deposit up to $100. That's underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Get ready for the NBA and get ready for the NBA playoffs. Go to underdogfantasy.com. Use the promo code WIN. Hi everybody, my name is Jason Lombardi. I'm an inspector at DryTech. At DryTech we offer three major services. The first one being basement waterproofing. The second service we offer is foundation and structural repairs. And then the third service that we offer is mold remediation. If you feel you are having a waterproofing issue, give DryTech a call or check us out online. Do you stream on a Roku, Fire Stick, Google TV, or Apple TV? Now you can watch 6ABC 24-7 with the 6ABC Philadelphia streaming app. For the big story on Action News. Search 6ABC Philadelphia and start streaming today. E-A-G-L-E-S. Eagles. What's up, everybody? Welcome back into the Philly Sports Power Hour. 
talking a bunch of fighting fills today as we get ready for opening day tomorrow, unfortunately not today, but spending a lot of time talking about our fighting fills. And what better guest to talk about the fighting fills than my man, the one and only Mark Farzetta. What's going on, Farzy? Looking a little oh, oh, nothing much, brother. Am I am I am I having a a bad connection? Because I just heard you jumping around. Not you, probably me, making you jump around digitally. Am I clearing up at all? You look a little pixelated, and you're a little delayed for whatever reason. Oh. But I don't know. You got to get that bandwidth up, dude. You got to get that. I, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's it's it's. <laughs> here's a classic line from early pandemic. Uh, I have full 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 bars, full Wi-Fi. I don't know what's going on here. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. if, if it's too bad and we got to bail, I'll try to reconnect. You're you're coming in. I think you're clearing up for me. You're clearing up for me. But what's not clearing up, I guess, is this weather and the fight and fills push until tomorrow. You disappointed? I am actually happy about it, to be honest with you, because to me, the worst day in sports to me as a uh, uh, a baseball first, like baseball was my first love and all that stuff. The worst day in sports is the day after opening day. That is my most hated day in all of sportsdom because we, I, as a baseball guy, you get really revved up and excited and, you know, Zach Wheeler pitch or in the past Aaron Nola. And I get all amped for, I love baseball. Baseball is every day. Baseball is amazing. And then it's like, all right, oh, what a great game. And then there's nothing for a day. Yeah. And then we're back into it like that. I hate the day after opening day. So the, the rain out actually happening and making, the first series of the season be continuous, I appreciate. And this series for Major League Baseball has got to be one of the best going to start to see. I mean, you got Wheeler, Nola, Suarez lined up against Strider. Who's pitching game two for the Braves? Uh, that's a great point. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't, I haven't gotten that far. <laughs> yeah, I'm still, I'm, that's me. I'm I haven't even gotten to game two. Game. I'm, right. I'm focused on Wheeler versus Strider, which would be great. <laughs> Well, yeah, I don't even know who's going. Uh oh, he froze on us. You still there, Farzi? Farzi's got to get a better connection. Sander, let's let's get let's get him out of here. Get out of here, Farzi. Come back with a better connection. So hopefully, uh, we can get Mark Farzetta back in. So when he comes back, we'll have him join the show. But yeah, it is interesting that Major League Baseball always has the Phillies home opener on a Thursday, and then they take off on Friday. So I guess they do that specifically for this reason, right? Probably specifically for this reason, so that if there ha is there going to be bad weather on opening day, you just push it. Because any other game, a rainout's not a problem, right? I mean, any other game, you, they get rained out. You could reschedule the game later on in the season. But for the home opener, you want to make sure it goes forward. And what we didn't talk about before Farsi joined the show was the Philadelphia Phillies hit an absolute home run, no pun intended, with who is going to throw out the first pitch tomorrow. And if you haven't seen it, the first pitch tomorrow will be thrown out by none other than Philadelphia Eagles legends, plural, Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox. Citizens Bank Park is going to be erupting when they announce Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox throwing out the first pitch. And it's cool that they're doing it on opening day because everybody's in their seats. Everybody's going to be sitting there in their seats because of all the formal introductions and everything. You're not going to have people coming in late. You will have everyone in their seats for when Jason Kelsey and Fletcher Cox throw out that first pitch. So that should be pretty cool. But are we getting Farsi back? I don't see Farsi here. May need to may need to pivot here. Waiting for my man, but I don't know. Xander, let me know if you connect with Farsi if he's uh coming back on. May have to pivot. But let's talk about let's talk some flyers until Farsi comes back. Let's see. So I'm getting hold on. My my producer's messaging me in the chat. So bear with us. This is the beautiful part about doing a live show. You got to go with it on the fly. So Xander's working on it with uh, with Farzi. We'll yell at Farzi when he gets back. But let's talk about the Flyers a little bit because I told you they're back in action tonight against the Montreal Canadiens in Montreal. And 
the Flyers have shown that they can play with all these good teams, all these good freaking teams they can play with. And now all they got to do, they just went through their gauntlet of the schedule. We all remember the Eagles gauntlet. They just went through their gauntlet. They just got to win against these lesser teams. And then hopefully we get playoff hockey back in South Philadelphia. But we're going to try our man Farzee again because I think he's back in the house. What's going on, Farzee? I'm here. I hope I'm clear. I hope I'm not pixelated. And I hope we stay connected. How are you, friend? Sorry about that. You got to get hard. Are you hardwired in or are you using Wi-Fi? Oh, no, no. All Wi-Fi all the time. The most powerful Wi-Fi, at least before today. <laughs> it See, used I to be. Hardwire, I hardwire in for this just so that you don't get those. Don't get those. Uh, because sometimes, you know what happens with Wi-Fi sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes it gets spotty. Got to unplug the router, count to 10, plug it back in. So <laughs> like it's 1999. My, so for my big screen in the basement, I got like like a 90-inch uh, flat screen. Nice. And I also, because I stream everything like most people, but I also have YouTube TV. Sure. So I'm also hardwired in to there so that I don't, I get the best of connection. Best Smart. of connection. Smart. Smart. It helps that my future father-in-law like does this for a living. He runs like ethernet cables and all that for a, for a company. So I'll have him come over for his house. Yeah. Does he, does if, he cross the river? Yeah. <laughs> if my mother-in-law is watching, she usually is tell, tell him he needs to get over to Farzee's to run some, uh, <laughs> some strong ethernet cables. Hey, anyway, we we're talking about the fills. I can't remember where we let off. We were talking about opening day and all that, but what yes. I was saying before you joined the show mm. was that I think this team can legitimately win the NL East, that they can get and catch the Braves and win simply if they have a quicker start to the season, unlike they've had the last two years. Where do you stand? You think they got a shot? Yeah, oh, they absolutely have a shot. And I love the attitude and the mindset of JT Romuto said at the end of spring, he's tired of seeing the Braves win the division. And quite frankly, I'm tired of seeing the Braves win the division. I'd, ver I'd much rather prefer they didn't or the Mets, you know, win the much uh, rather that didn't happen. But to me, if you've watched baseball, especially over the last two seasons, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. True, you want your team to be as as great as possible for 162 games, and you you, you want to have the best record in baseball. But once the playoffs start, it doesn't seem to matter. So for me, I look at it like this: the Phillies have proven over the last two seasons, in particular, they have shown you you don't have to be the best team in baseball. Every other team just gets hot at the right time, and they become a better season win your division i don't think it necessarily goes against you winning a world series either so if the phillies can cross uh, you know check both those boxes of yet again being um you know a hot team at the end of the season and also somehow maintain a a good streak and steady winning throughout the year like we have seen from the braves in a time the mets over the last couple of seasons then take advantage and why not try to be a wire to wire first place team and dominate I already know you can rally at the end of the year. Show me that you, it's, it's not going to take until June for you to remember that you could be a really good ball club. Plus, uh, the, the, the rotation for me, even without Taiwan Walker, is still pretty damn solid. Not as solid as I would have liked to it have been with Jordan Montgomery joining the staff. It kills yeah. me that he ended up joining that one-year deal with the Arizona Diamondbacks. And for yeah, me, when I saw – him, man. They could have gotten I, him. When I saw – I think – was it Jeff Passan or Bob – I think it was Bob Nightingale – of USA Today that put it out uh, originally saying that he was agreeing to terms with the, on a deal with the Diamondbacks. And I said, don't be a long term. If, if, if this is a short-term deal, I'm going to be pissed. If it's a one- or two-year deal, I'm going to be pissed. Sure enough, one year, $25 million, And I'm thinking, come on! You couldn't have yeah. done that deal? Um, I'm surprised. Yeah. There must be some, th some other reason there because we know Middleton will spend the money. It doesn't yeah. matter. They'll spend the money. So they did they just not like Jordan Montgomery? I mean, did they just not think he's as good as maybe all of us think that he is? Why not I, make that move? I, I don't know, especially when it's a one-year deal. Um, the only reason is maybe it kicks you up to the next tier of the luxury tax or puts you up too close to it. So that if you wanted to make any acquisitions as the year went on, it might make that more difficult. But, hey, if you want to talk about stupid money, man, let's spend some some stupid money. And by the way, not to change the subject, but speaking of stupid money, the Dodgers are already in a heap of trouble right now with the Shohei Otani news, and I, I don't envision that getting easier or better for them. But to sign a catcher, a twenty-eight year, a twenty-eight year old catcher, to a ten-year deal, holy lord! Like they did with Will Smith, that's insane. That's absolutely insane. That that right there, this is what made me think of it. That right there, 
is stupid money. A hell of a player, but a 10-year deal for a 28-year-old catcher who's only played an inning and a third elsewhere? That's bonkers to me. Bonkers. Yeah, I guess they're looking at it as, hey, we're going all in over the next couple of seasons. You know, probably not going to have him for the next 10, but if we can get him for another three or four, yeah, I don't know. We'll see. But the Dodgers are going to be Dodgers are going to be tough. But we'll worry about the Dodgers in the postseason. I keep looking just at the Braves because like we're talking about, can they win the NL East? We're talking about having the, the hotter start. Right. Is I look up and down this lineup. And is there any position on the Philadelphia Phillies that's worse in 2024 than it was in 2023? Uh, no, there is I, I no, think you, I think you could make the argument. They're better in every position. I mean, probably equal, but not worse in any position. So even at center field, like Brandon Marsh is a really good center fielder. It just so happens that Johan Rojas is a great center fielder. Um, if Johan Rojas hits 200, you know, that ain't yeah. great. <laughs> that obviously is not great. But you look at, around this lineup, and it's a funny thing. Like I look at the Eagles, and I think Matt Hennessy is a very underrated signing. For as good as Whit Merrifield has been in his Major League Baseball career, I still think it's a very underrated signing. And the reason I'll make the comparison is because of the options that it does give you. The I, In Merrifield's case, insurance, I guess you could throw at it there. Certainly in Hennessy's case, but... Okay, um, Bryson Stott needs a break at second. Merrifield, go play second. You need you have some struggles there with uh, center field and Johan Rojas. Bang, Brandon Marsh moves to center. Whit Merrifield goes uh, and stays in in left field. Uh, obviously, you have a guy like Kyle Schwarber who will be a designated hitter more often than not this season. Gives you some optionality in right field as well if you look at maybe giving Nick Castellanos a break. Uh, but certainly, it gives you a lot of options. But one thing that is just amazing to me, is that with Bryce Harper at first base, I believe at the plate, you've already have you have a best you have a best first baseman you've had since you know Ryan Howard was here. And then at first base with the glove, I mean Ryan Howard was not exactly a gold glover at first base. And, you and know, Bryce looks like now he's been playing there his whole life the way it's doing. insane. I I am trying to think of like and this is going to be high praise for a name that doesn't exactly get great, great praise. But like, he was a good fielder. Uh, Rico Bronia. Like, he's the first name that pops up. Travis Lee. Like, who was a good first baseman, fielding first baseman for the Phillies? That's as far back as you got to go. Uh, as, or as, as you can go. Loved, as much as I loved Reese Hoskins, he wasn't great in the field. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you get, like, I'm trying to think of just guys at first base for the Phillies that I went, oh, I can trust that. Like, Cody Clemens, glove-wise, was good. But, I mean, he was a... You know, part-time player. So for me, with Bryce Harper, I am stoked to have him at first base, both as a regular bat in the lineup and a regular glove at the first base bag. And you mentioned Johan Rojas, you know, if he could bat 200. And I see some people in the chat talking about, hey, you know, Rojas, I'm still not sold on him. And I, before you came on, we were also streaming live on TikTok and people were saying, no, I would rather have Pache. And the example that I'm giving, and I actually stole this from Ricky Batalico, is 2008. You look at Carlos Ruiz, and I know Chooch did some things at the plate in the postseason, but you look at his regular season. In 2008, Ruiz, as your eight-hole hitter, batted 219. He had 44 RBIs. Excuse me, 31 RBIs. He had 44 walks, 31 RBIs. He batted 219. But it was fine because of what he did behind the plate. Well, Johan Rojas, what he's going to do in center field, isn't that worth if he only bats 200, 215? In this lineup, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. One of the things I said was uh, uh, on yesterday's show was, the, if this lineup needs Johan Rojas to bat 330, then there's a bigger problem than Johan Rojas. So uh, I don't, like, he's going to be your nine-hole hitter. He's going to be maybe an eight-hole hitter. He's not exactly anybody that I am looking for to come up with the big hit uh, in a clutch situation. I love the idea that he bulked up. Maybe that'll help with his stamina throughout the year. Maybe that'll help him, uh, you know, hit some gaps for some doubles and triples, maybe even inside the Parkers with his speed. But all I need him to be is that great center fielder that he seems to be pretty natural at when it comes to playing that position. I don't need him to be a guy even hitting 15 home runs in the lineup. I don't need him to be a guy hitting 300. If if Johan Rojas can give me 250 batting oh. down there, if he can give me 240, then okay. 
That'd be great. That's great. That's phenomenal. Exactly. That's phenomenal. It's wonderful. Um, and a guy that can maybe get on base more than the 214 clip he was at in spring training, uh, then I'll be a happy camper with Johan Rohan. Oh, and uh, lay, me, lay me down some bunts. Lay me down some bunts throughout the year. Yeah, maybe he was working on that too. While we're talking batting averages, I talked about this before you joined as well. Bryson Stott, you think he can hit 300 this year? Oh, absolutely. Uh, but basically absolutely. did it last year until August, and then he had that <laughs> Yeah, he it, – it's so funny. I, I, we've talked about the leadoff hitter before in this lineup, and it's obviously Kyle Schwarber, but Bryson Stott is just that prototypical leadoff hitter. Trey Turner can be, but just off the top of my head, I'm trying to think about number of pitches on average they see, and Trey Turner is not one of those guys, but um, especially if you factor in the first four months of last season. But Stott, for him, a, a count doesn't start until he's got two strikes on him. And every once in a while, like it's not something he does every single time. Like I like the idea, especially if you've gone around in the order a couple of times, two, three times, and you're coming up to the plate and you're thinking first pitch fastball from a bullpen arm, jump all over that, pounce on it. Okay. If you're thinking and sitting first pitch fastball, if you're sitting on a the first pitch breaking ball, demolish it. I have no problem with that whatsoever. But he has a great mindset. He's got a great approach. He's got a great plan to go up to the plate, take as many pitches as possible, see what the pitcher's got, especially early on in a ball game, and try to get deep into that count. Uh, and then try to win that at bat by getting a base hit, working a walk, whatever the case may be. That is Bryson Stott's mentality. That's his mindset. And he's not a, he's not afraid to foul off pitches. He's not afraid of doing that. Again, he's not afraid to be a two strikes. I think he's got the perfect mindset. He's the perfect type of leadoff hitter. But for whatever reason, the Phillies only win games when Kyle Schwarber's at the top of the order. I'm going to ask you what is more likely to happen, okay? You ready? We'll play a little game. What is more likely to happen? Bryson Stott hits 300 or Kyle Schwarber hits 50 home runs? Ooh. Now, neither's ever happened, right? Schwarber had 46 right. and 22, 47 and 23. I don't believe he's ever hit 50 when he was – not with the film. Well, double check that though. Kyle Schwarber only worrying about DH, only worried about hitting. Doesn't got to go out there and loaf around in the uh <laughs> loaf around in the uh in left field. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with Schwarber's 50 home runs. So yeah, let me um, look. The closest he got. Was with the Phillies last year, forty-seven. He had forty-seven uh -huh. last year, forty-six the year before, then thirty-two, thirty-two, only eleven, thirty-eight, twenty-six, thirty. Yeah, so he's never done it, but he did get close. So you think it's more likely Schwarber hits fifty home runs than Bryson Stott hits three hundred? Yeah, and look, I I would love to see Bryson Stott be able to hit three hundred. Don't get me wrong, but if you're asking me what is more likely, what is the easier bet? I think it's easier to bet. In, in this lineup, with being a designated hitter, maybe having a guy like Trey Turner bat behind him again, who's not starting out with an ice-cold streak like he did for four months, gets him a, maybe a couple of more fastballs, that to me would equal maybe three or four more home runs that would obviously get him at that 50 home run plateau. So uh, that to me I think is more likely. Less likely to be injured if he's a designated hitter because he's not playing in the field. I'm going to go with 50 over Bryson Stott's 300. All right, I got another one for you. Let's switch over to the, let's do, let's over to our two aces. Aaron right. Nola, Zach Wheeler. Who's more likely to get 250 strikeouts this season? I'm going to go with Nola on that. Interesting. Because Nola if you it really follows Nola has like these kinds of years. He's up and he's down. He's up and he's down. And last year, for the most part, was down. He had a couple of good stretches. I think he had an eight inning, eight inning score, eight scoreless game against the uh, Astros. Hit a little bit of wall after that. Wasn't able to put together consecutive starts very often where he just looked dominant. Like the numbers that I look at for that are like seven innings, no more than two runs, six innings, no more than two runs. He didn't have very many starts. June might have been where he hit a little bit of a stride last year. But for the most part, last year was a down year for Aaron Nola. I look at this upcoming season as that upswing year for Aaron Nola. So if I'm going to go in the, what was the number you gave, 250? 250 strikeouts. I'm going to go with Nola over Wheeler in that regard. And, yes, youth does 
play into that and the ebbs and flows of a career like Nola has had. I'm going to go with that as well. Now, I don't think either one of them has ever done it. So Nola last year had 202. The year before, he had 235, so he got close. Wheeler, you got to go back a couple seasons. He did have 247, so we'll see if they can get uh, 250 strikeouts. But I'm excited. I know you're excited, too. I know you love your Phillies. Yeah, sure, man. You get all fired up for opening day, and then you realize, whew, we got 161 more, 161 yeah. more games. It is I'm a in. marathon, not a sprint, man. Yeah. Yeah, I although I tend to treat it like a sprint. It's a very long sprint for me. <laughs> well, I live and die with every pitch. Oh, my he's getting squeezed. He's getting yeah. squeezed. By the way, Max Fried gets the start. Uh Saturday. On, on Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Saturday. 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 Yeah. So we got so that's great, man. You got Wheeler Strider and then Nola Freed. So that should be great. But talking yeah, about I'm really looking for and I'm really oh. looking forward to Ranger too this year. I'm really looking forward to Ranger Suarez. Yeah, and it's really the first time we've seen Ranger go through a spring training without any issues. No injuries, no visa, no World Baseball Classic. So what he's going to be able to do this year should be exciting. And he rang the bell last night at the Sixers game in an Iverson jersey, no shirt underneath, arms out. (laughs) Place was going nuts for Ranger last night. Bells out, guns out, my friend. Come on now. Uh, By the way, is there any better boo in sports than the possession boo? Like every time you touch the ball, we're booing you. I don't think there's a better like obviously the introductory boo always gets the headline, but you really no, got to be a dedicated fan base to boo someone every time they touch the ball. That to it, me is the best. It it works in basketball and hockey, you know, because yeah. when they do when like in hockey too, when they touch the puck and everybody boos. Do you remember when uh Yager used to touch the puck and everyone would like whistle and stuff? Oh, oh my god, with the with the perm pompadour he would rock. Not the pomp perm, the, the perm mullet. Yeah. Good look. I, I look, I hate the Penguins more than any team, and that includes the Dallas Cowboys. But when I gotta give credit to them. When they honored Yager recently, two things. One, they all wore the mullet yeah. perm, the permed yeah. mullet, which was amazing, the, the wig. And then the other thing was Yager shouting out the fact that he goes, thank you, Pittsburgh. Uh, for those that were too young to watch me play, like my girlfriend, I just <laughs> want to thank you for being – That was, I got to – like I, the, his whole season as a flyer, I expected him to take off the sweater and there would be like a penguin on his chest and him being like a double agent. But I look back on it and, I mean, Drew played his best hockey next to Yager. Yeah. Go figure. Um, what it, what a year that was. Well, what's crazy is, so Yager played 24 seasons in the NHL, and I couldn't stand him when he was with the Penguins and he was with the Rangers, and then sure. he comes here and he does. He only plays one season, yeah. and I absolutely fell in love with Yammer Yager that year, and now love him. I mean, I think that was one of the mistakes is them not bringing him <laughs> back because Giroux did flourish under Yager, and I think the team had the success that it had because you had a guy like Yager, and he went on the play after that, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think he played like eight more seasons. <laughs> I think he played uh, like eight yeah. more seasons after that. I know yeah, he went and- to Russia for a little while. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, but in the NHL, yeah, because after that he played for Dallas, Boston, the Devils, the Panthers, Panthers, and the Flames. If I'm not mistaken, when he was with the Panthers, I think he got or was getting voted into the All-Star game the first time it was a three-on-three All-Star game. And he had one of the greatest tweets ever. And he was just like, like from an athlete, he was like, guys, thank you, but I'm like 45 years old. I will die. <laughs> and I just thought that was hilarious. Uh, um, but you know, uh, he yeah. used to get, yeah. They used to have to give him a key to the skate zone over in Voorhees because he would go – in like the middle of the night and skate and work out. And I mean, like the guy is just, I, that's one of those athletes where I hated him before he got here. And then he was here for a short time, but I just grew to love and respect him very quickly in a very short time. But let's talk if about you, the flyers. If you ever get a chance to ask Bundy about playing against Yager, cause he always played him really well. Yeah. Bundy himself seems dumbfounded that he was so good at playing against Yager. <laughs> it's a fun conversation, but anyway, yeah. Bundy, Chris Terrian, he's referring to. Yes. Um, let's talk about the fly guys. Cause you talked about how we were saying it's not a sprint, but right now the flyers are in a sprint nine games left, only three points up on the Washington capitals. Washington capitals have two games in hand. Flyers are back in action tonight in Montreal. Capitals are in Toronto. Let's hear your prediction. Do the flyers make the playoffs? My prediction is the flyers make the playoffs and I, before the season, I know we've talked about this a lot, but before the season, I was like, just, you know, give me some optimism for next year. Just 
get some picks, make some trades, make some moves. They did that as well. And I was like, you know what? That's it. I just show me some progression. That's all I want to see, some progression. I've seen a lot of progression, and now I'm going to get that progression uh, with Danny Breer as a GM, who I think has done a bang-up job so far as his first year as being the real GM. Uh, and you have seen that progression, and you have also seen this team now, at least, worst-case scenario, give you those meaningful games in March and April. And we have longed for that for a long time in Philadelphia when it's come to the Flyers, and they have certainly done that in a, in a year where I wasn't expecting it. So I want them to make the playoffs. I think they're going to make the playoffs. The number one reason why right now is you look at the way they played against the Rangers, and you can focus on the fact that they were up two, they were up two nothing. Then yeah. they blew that lead, but then they go down a goal, they come back. They go down a goal, they come back. I hate to say this because I feel like the Eagles have kind of ruined this phrase, but they found a way to at least stay competitive in that game to at least get a point out of it, a very crucial point in this tightly wrapped playoff race right now. So watching the way they played. See how they have battled up until recently against the Florida Panthers. Uh, that was a 4-1 loss the other night. Seeing them battle in that way lets me know that when they have those opportunities, they're going to be right on the doorstep for it. So I'm going to say they finish the job and they make the postseason. So I have a confession to make, and I'm hoping some people don't call me a fair weather fan, but they may. So I had season tickets for the Flyers for a long time, and then <gasps> I gave them up because they just became very difficult to watch. I mean, having season tickets, I still would watch the games on TV, but I'm not you know, going down there to watch this terrible brand of hockey. I went to the game on Sunday with Bridget Tobin, who's here in the chat, my lovely fiance. And the energy in the building, even though they lost to the Florida Panthers, the energy in the building was back. On Monday, I got my season tickets back. So <laughs> we are now season ticket holders again to the Philadelphia Flyers because I said, I love where the direction of this team is headed. This is what I missed. Meaningful yeah. hockey in March, in April, playoff hockey. So, yes, I got my season tickets back. Maybe I'm a Fairweather fan, but I just love the energy. They say a new era of orange, and they are right, man. I, I'm really enjoying this Flyers team. Now, a yeah. team that I'm not necessarily enjoying, but I'm still holding out hope for, is the Sixers. So we were in the building last night, me and Bridget, because we had our 97-5 knockout tournament nice. um, after the game. Bridget, last woman standing in the knockout tournament. She's there you go. Yeah. There you go, hon. She crushed it, but a tough loss. But I'm holding out hope that Embiid is coming back before the game. Nick Nurse said it's a good likelihood he does come back. What do you think the Sixers team can do if Embiid comes back? I, I get bounced out of the second round of the playoffs. <laughs> Same old stuff. But here's the thing. like they, I Obviously, they got to avoid the play-in tournament. That's going to be very difficult with eight, nine games left, whatever it is now. Uh, and Embiid playing, best-case scenario, five of those games? Because, look, I don't think they're going to release the Hounds with Joel Embiid. I think they're going to have him play, monitor, and then have him play again. So he might even, even if he plays with five games left, he probably won't play again until he might skip a game and play three and then maybe play the rest after that. Uh, but if they're in the play in tournament, then you're going to be playing one of the teams that normally bounced you out in the second round anyway. Yeah. Like one of the things the, the, the Sixers have benefited from is being a one, two, or three seed. Now they're not going to have that luxury, even with Joel Embiid coming back. So, and be on the road. So, I think their only chance to make it to the second round is, assuming he comes back healthy even, the only way they come back and get into that second round is if they avoid the play-in tournament. And as of right now, I believe they're a game and a half into the play-in tournament. Yeah, they're half game eight in, yeah. behind yeah. Indiana, who's the six. Yeah, so that's not good. That's not good. That's bad. That's very bad. Um, and. Uh, I, I hate to say this, but I'm already in the mindset of next year with the with the Sixers. So it, it is what it is now, unfortunately, and it's not a good thing. So talking about next year, because there was a player in the building last night that I guess could potentially be a Sixer next year. Am I? I think Paul George is a free agent this, this uh -huh. summer. Yeah. You know, what do you think? It's it's a shame because it looks like the Philadelphia 76ers will have a ton of flexibility this offseason. I think the only players under contract are what? Embiid and, and Maxi. I think everybody else is a free agent. They're going to have a ton of cap space, ton of draft capital. But there's not that many people available. This isn't a big – there's not a big whale to go after. Would you like a guy like Paul George? Would you like to see them maybe get more creative and figure out a trade? What, what do you want to see them do next? Yeah, I would, I would – I'd love to see Paul George in a Sixers uniform. This is the base, This is basically how you have to swap it out. It, it's, you're moving on from Tobias Harris. Yeah, That's happening. The Buddy Heald audition – 
Uh, got back on track a little bit last night. Three. He had a big three at the end of the game there. Yeah. So it didn't hold. Three threes. Uh, I think he hit two. I think it was two clutch threes in the in the third quarter when the Clippers were starting to come back into it, or maybe it was late in the third. I can't remember. But the, the auditions started to get a little bit more back on track. But even if that, that is the case, you're still going to be looking around the league for more talent, more consistent talent, somebody that's not just a shooter, someone that can slash and get you those points, somebody that can be a scorer, and that's obviously a guy like Paul George. I would be I'd be into it, especially because I think in that realm, at the age of Paul George now, Tyrese Maxey would still stay the number two. So that would be a full year of him being one or two as the scoring option for the Sixers. And then going into next year, he'd already have that under his belt with Paul George coming in with the obvious uh, you know veteran know-how that he does have. I think that'd be a nice fit here in Philadelphia. So I would be in favor of bringing in Paul George. Yeah, I'm looking at his contract now. So, yeah, he still has that player option for next year if he wanted to stay with the Clippers, which yeah. I doubt he'll, he'll exercise. 33, he's going to be 34 before next season, and I'm assuming yeah. he would be a max deal guy, right? Probably mm -hmm. be a max deal. Yeah, in that range, but um, see what the Sixers work out there, yeah. So we will see. Farzy, tomorrow, good Friday. Do you eat meat? Are you, are you a meat, meat eater? I, see, I, I, I don't abide. I, I actually do eat eat meat. I don't follow that rule, but I, I was pretty good my entire life up until this year. I was really, really good at not eating meat on Friday and some of that stuff. But like, uh, I heard that Frank, uh, that the guy in Rome, the, the Pope fella, he was like, uh, hey, eat, 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 eat what you want. Uh, and I'm like, ah, I think I'm going to do that. So I, I think it was Pope Frank being like, you can eat what you want. And, um, I, uh, I've, 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 uh, I've, I've not been the best Catholic this, this, uh, this Lenten season, unfortunately. Xander, my producer in the ch in the private chat, is saying there should be no <laughs> meat. Stay, stay strong, Catholics, he said. But I'll tell you this. I think that we deserve, what do they call it? Special special dispensation. Dispensa 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 special yeah. dispensation. If you're going down to the ballpark, a hot dog shouldn't count as yeah. day on, on Friday. Because it's, you know, it's open. Nation National Cheesesteak Day. Like would always fall on a Friday during Lent. I'm like, this is BS. Yeah. This is you know, we should get a special dispensation from the Pope of in Philadelphia for Philadelphia Catholics to be like, yeah, I have a cheesesteak and a scoozy. You know what I mean? Oh, here's That's where, all. Here's where I kind of lost it. So I went to Catholic school and it was eighth grade, and we had our eighth grade dance, and it was on a Friday during during Lent, and the priest of the school was just like we're granting everyone special dispensation that you don't you you can eat meat tonight since we're here at a at a dance or whatever. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like you do a good blessing. That was a good yeah, like, blessing. Wait, that was a good it. blessing. That's all you need. You got that's eat all meat. you need. You could hey maybe hey if you're getting married maybe you could be a deacon. You, you might have it. You might have a vocation about you, my friend. You still can be a deacon. Well, oh yeah, my grandfather was, I was in when I was like I think this must have been like elementary school. I said to my mom and my and my dad I said I, I think I'm going to be a priest. Yeah. And they said, they said, why do you want to be a priest? I said, because it's the easiest job. I said, what stress do you have? The, your food is taken care of, your ha house. And then my mom was like, that's not a good reason to be a priest. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, at like 12, I didn't understand that. But yeah. yes. I'm like, what a stress-free job. You don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to worry about sponsorships Dude, and all that crap that we have my, to worry about. My grandfather was deacon, Catholic church, 25 years deacon, you know. He would come home from the funeral parlors and stuff because I lived with my grandparents for a year. He'd come back and he would go under the counter, right? Live to be 100. So take notes, people. Go under the kitchen counter, open it up, put a bottle of Jack Daniels on the counter, a shot glass, pour it, lift it up to the Lord, as he would say, and make the sign of the cross with the shot of whiskey, and knock it back, sit down, and chill out, watch the Orioles. That's what he would do because he's in Baltimore. But yeah. And he, lived, and he lived to 100. Lived to 100. Take notes, you people drinking smoothies. Yeah. Well, listen, Farsi, whether you eat meat or not, happy Easter to you and your family. Mm, back at you, brother. Bona Pasqua. I got a uh, big Easter egg hunt on Sunday for the kiddos. They're they're excited. They love the do Easter egg hunts. Do you go dollars? Do you put dollars, bills, or bills in? Big bills, do you? Big bills. Big bills. <laughs> no, I don't. So we do it at... Uh, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a golfer now, so we belong to a golf club. So we're going there okay. for our Easter brunch, and then they do like a big Easter egg hunt on the golf Moist. course. So I think there's probably Moist. candy in there. Although uh, my I, son, he's probably not watching. My five year old went to the dentist this morning. Two cavities for Leo. Two cavities for my boy. So my daughter called me all excited. No cavities, Daddy. And then my son, <laughs> I got two. I got busted. Yep. <laughs> got to brush his teeth.
By the way, I got to tell you this. Speaking of the big bills thing, I was on with Sills last week. I saw it. I and saw he, did, it. You, did you see me crying? No. I, I literally was crying. He got out of nowhere. He goes, well, I know you were on with our Paisan. I know you were on with. Oh, uh, I didn't see this part. He goes, he goes, I know you were on with our Paisan. I know you were on with big bills. And he goes like that. <laughs> Bill, I died. I literally, I was out of frame. I don't know oh, how long, man. maybe an hour, just crying, laughing. I pulled the Johnny Carson. I had the tissues. Oh, oh. Yeah, me and Sills, me and Sills haven't been seeing eye to eye on anything these days. <laughs> haven't been seeing eye to eye on anything. But we still got to get, yeah, him and I have to get our uh, Battle Royale round two going. But I may need Farsi in my corner. There you go. There you go, Hans. Oh. There you go. Well, listen, happy Easter, my friend. I appreciate you making time, brother. I'll see you next week. Back at you and to your audience as well. Sorry for the delay earlier. No worries, man. Mark Farzetta, my man. Always fun to have our Thursdays with Farzy. But uh, we're running out of time. So like we end every Philly Sports Power Hour, a little today in sports history. So March 28th, 1990, Michael Jordan scored 69 points in a game. Well, the reason I bring that up is because that is the closest he would ever get to 70 points. So you remember earlier in the year, January 22nd, Joel Embiid dropped 70. Luca, four days later, dropped 73. 10 NBA players have scored 70 points, but Michael Jordan, who in my opinion, one of the greatest of all time, the GOAT, don't give me LeBron, give me MJ, 69 points today, March 28th, 1990, but never got more than 69. But ironically, the player who did it six times, Wilt Chamberlain, also played his last game ever in the NBA today, March 28th, 1972, Wilt Chamberlain's last game ever. So, some basketball today in sports history. March 28th, 1972, Wilt Chamberlain's last game ever. The only player to have six 70-point games. But March 28th, 1990, Michael Jordan, 69 points. The closest he ever got to 70. But this was the Philly Sports Power Hour. Appreciate all of you being here. Hit that like button. Hit that share button. Make sure you're following me on all your social platforms. I tell you that every day, but just a reminder. And as always, go Birds.